Hello, welcome to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. For today's lessons, we'll be engaging with some of the basic concepts in sociology. We'll also be looking at some of the sociological theories and the importance of Caribbean society. I'm Orville Beckford, a teacher in sociology at the UWI and the Exeter Community College. We will start today by, going, by looking at the basic definition of sociology. A systematic study of individuals and groups as they interact. Is a basic definition, is the most basic one you'll find, because that is how sociology is, dealing with groups and individuals. It's difficult to just talk about uh, individuals alone because we born, we're in a group, we're a part of a group. Um, as we grow, we become part of church, part of school, and part of many groups. What is important for sociology is the interaction and looking at the interaction, how individuals interact. But there is another definition, another definition that says um, sociology was developed to account for the changes that accompanied industrial society. Important to keep that one in mind because I've seen in Cape Crescent where they ask you about what are these changes and how do they help in the development of sociology. So I'll go through that one again, that sociology was developed to account for the changes that accompanied industrial society. What is also important is that you should be able to, you, you should be able to, um, to know what the syllabus is about, we, you, you should have gone through the CAPE syllabus, you can download it, it is free, so you can follow, um, you can follow on it time after time and find out where the teacher is. So the syllabus itself says that the sociological perspective, module one, sociological concept, perspective and methods, we will do some of them. Module two, social institutions, family, religion, education, and module three, social stratification. We will, we will look at social stratification as well towards the end. Um, here, this, the people at Cape are very, um, they are very understanding. They give you and tell you exactly what is it that you're expected to do. That, um, that the whole, the, the importance of sociology, the rationale for sociology, and that despite evidence of our social economic transformation and influence of globalization, we still maintain a distinct identity, which is why generally when we ask the questions, we ask about the Caribbean, about the Caribbean in terms of uh, what, how do you relate this theory to the Caribbean? How do you relate these concepts to the Caribbean? But these are all in the syllabus, so you can, you can have a look at them. But it's just very important that you bear in mind as you think of doing the exam, that you look at these things. So we said that the examination will test candidates' skills and ability to, one, interpret and make inferences from qualitative and quantitative data. Your teacher would have gone through with you early what you mean by qualitative and quantitative data. Distinguish between facts, opinions, and valid judgment. We tend to, um, in Jamaican society, to go with what people are saying outside. That bears no relationship to, to empirical study or to facts. Use various methods of investigation. Use concepts, theories, perspectives. That's why we are going through the concepts and the theories because you're expected to use them. So we go through them first because we assume that you, you understand them. So while you're, you're going through the theories, we make use of the concepts and on the assumption that you understand them. And select and apply social perspective to a Caribbean concept. So when we speak about families, we're speaking about families within the Caribbean. We're speaking about social stratification, we're speaking about social stratification within the Caribbean. When we speak um, about um, other issues, um, Caribbean social theories like pluralization, um, plural uh, society theory, we're speaking of it within the context of the Caribbean. God, this is where we are, this is how we are, we are developing our own identity. I carried a couple of books to show you because it's important as you prepare that you know what is what. Um, on the syllabus, there is the themes and perspective. This is what we call the Matthews and Plummer. The, no, R. Lambus and Alburn. Um, social themes and perspective. Now, this is a textbook. This is a textbook, so it is a continuous text. So you can start, you can read about um, the introduction, the theories, and so on. So it is a textbook. So is the Giddon, also a textbook. 
in terms of continuous text as opposed to a reader. Now this one, which is very important, especially for unit two and the, and the latter part of unit one. This is the Caribbean sociology introductory read, readings. Very important that you understand that a reader, as it is, is different from a text. The reader will, uh, will not have continued text. So there are various articles in it by different Caribbean writers. So you go in it to look for a, a specific thing. So for example, you're doing family, there are about five articles on the families. You're doing um, social stratification, there are about six articles on social stratification. And so this is a reader. So this really should supplement the, um, the other text where you want to expand and see what, um, what different theorists has to say, um, have to say about the, the various concepts, family, social stratification, Caribbean social theories, as the case may be. So we'll now continue. So how we read sociologically. Now, I keep saying, saying to students, we sometimes run into difficulties because we really didn't get a proper introduction to how we read and write sociologically. And so we, we, we read and write sociologically. So we draw on C. Wright Mill's sociological imagination. C. Wright Mill's um, some years ago said that in order for us to read and write sociologically, we should have a historical sensibility, an anthropological sensibility, and a critical sensibility. What do you mean by a, a historical sensibility? One of the requirements for doing K-Pod sociology is history. Because it's very difficult for you to understand sociology without understanding its, um, the region's history. We do Caribbean sociology, so we expect you to understand the history of the Caribbean. So we, um, C. Wright Mills is saying to us that we need to pay attention to how the history affects the present and will also affect the future. So when you start to do a question, in social, you want to long answer question, say on family. It's hard for you to start writing on families and don't give an introduction that have a historical sensibility. How did the Caribbean family come about? Uh, what is it? What are some of the factors that contributed to a Caribbean family? Why do we have so many different family farms in the Caribbean? You perhaps would have gone through about five or six in a class. We have about 26 different family farms, but they all have a historical context. There's a reason why they are part of our lexicon. There's a reason why they are part of our Caribbean society. So it's very important that we, we, we know the history. The next one is an anthropological sensibility. Um, anthropological sounds like a big word, but no. Anthropology study different societies and civilization. But one of the main things that an anthropologist must carry to the table is that um, you can't be ethnocentric. You don't mean by ethnocentric when you judge another person's culture by your own cultural standard. So if I'm looking at the pygmies in, um, in the Amazon, I can transfer my Eurocentric type of uh, upbringing to say that, oh, they don't eat around a table, so therefore they are so nasty. No. Um, we have to look at them for what they are. And so for sociology, we do the same we employ an anthropological sensibility. That is, we must say, okay, um, I'm studying, say, religion. Not all religions are like Christianity. No. And so we can't say because this religion is not like Christianity. It is foolish and stupid and so on and so forth. No. We must have an anthropological sensibility. What about it? Um, is there a level of social control? Um, can we see what are the theological things about religion rather than start to want to find that you're putting in personal things? I think this is so-and-so. You know you're, you're getting into trouble. You're not being anthropological. Just evaluate the thing as it is and say what you think of it. Don't get personal. Don't use one to curse off another one. Don't. And so the, the last one is critical sensibility. In this postmodern age that we are living in, we criticize everything. You'll notice that after each of the sociological theories in the book, there is a criticism of that particular theory. So we have functionalism, there is a criticism of functionalism. We have Marxist conflict, there is a criticism of Marxist conflict. 
we have um, feminine theory, there is a criticism of feminine theory because we expect that you will criticize everything. And this is important because this is how society um, produce, reproduces itself and how society progresses. If the first time that a chair was made, piece of metal here, piece of metal there. And that was all that we thought that could be a chair. Nobody thought of saying, perhaps we can make something better. Let us criticize this. How then we come by um, settees in our homes? We have some music theater with um, seats that lean all the way back and your, foot go, um, your feet um, will go up. And so that would not have been invented. But somebody dared to criticize, according to Thomas Kuhn, this philosopher, that um, society progresses when we learn to falsify things. So if we think that everything that we have now in society is the best, then nobody will want to think of anything better, invent a better chair, a better radio, a better television, and things would just get stuck. So we must have this critical sensibility. At the level where you are in school, at the sixth form level, this is first year university. We expect that you'll have critical thinking skills, that you'll come to us with critical thinking skills. So the CAPE level is the, that level where we are introducing you to critical thinking skills. Very important because um, I know you learn, you, you, you grew up in a socialization that said children should be seen and not heard. So there is a reluctance for you to criticize things. We are saying no, you need to abandon that now at the CAPE level because we do expect you to criticize. We do expect you to say um, that I think differently. Um, my, my opinion is that this should be so and so. I think that we can use another perspective on it and so on and so forth. So which is why it is important that you learn to, to criticize and that you develop a critical thinking, criti critical thinking skills. So just some fundamental concepts which we'll, which we'll use. I didn't go through all of them, but some of the major ones I've gone through that it's important for you to know. I'll start with social order because the first social theory that we start with, functionalism, the starting point of examining society is social order. So, in, um, so we look at social order, social change, um, so on and so forth, socialization, and so on. We won't be able to cover all of them, but I'll put them here because this is how it is on the syllabus. This is how it is on the CAPE syllabus. So you should know all of them. Um, social change, status, role, values, norms, sanctions, social group, in-group, out-group, socialization, and so on. So I, I tackled just a few of them because time would not allow to tackle all of them. Now, social structure. Some people think it's rather esoteric, and esoteric means just a little up in the sky. It refers to the framework of society, that is the patterns around which society is organized, and the term structure. This is the structure and culture of society in which relationships develop in the social group and establishes or relate to one another both within the family and among family units. So it is, it's important that we understand that we operate in a social structure. Jamaica has a social structure. Spanish Town has a social structure, St. Catherine has a social structure, um, Clarendon has a social structure, Montego Bay itself also has a social structure. So the, the existing social structure for society is instrumental in guiding our behavior. So we are going to, we are going to act and behave according to the social structure in which we are growing up. That social structure will, will, will give us norms, values, um, perspective norm and prospective norms, all of them, prescriptive norm. And so it will tell us how to behave. All right, social institutions. Now, you will constantly keep referring to social institutions. So it's a very important concept that you understand that concept um, from the get-go because this is a recurring theme in sociology in terms of the, the various social institutions. And here, institutions are not physical institutions. Um, they are more what we, that we kind of conjure up uh, in terms of sociologically. So we say that they represent an, an enduring organized system of behavioral patterns that each society develops to meet its basic needs. What is important here is that, um, that pattern, that, that, that learned pattern, 
that recurring pattern. That is what the arm distinguishes one social institution from another. However, they all have uh, um, this pattern behavior. So for example, um, school. You come to school every morning, but there's a pattern. You know what time is your class, who will be the lecturer, what time is lunch time. Of course, we all know what time is lunch time, definitely. Um, we know what time is break. We know what time is the last, the last lesson, what time school ends. So we, we fall into a pattern. So you come to school assuming that this pattern is working. Um, we are on the road, um, you know, we drive on the left, there's an uh, hexagonal sign with the letter S-T-O-P um, on it, you stop. So we, um, society is about a pattern. So all of these social institutions form a pattern. So for example, um, you go to church, church generally there's a pattern in terms of what you do, the pastor will say a few words, um, he will march up, go up onto the pulpit, then they sing a hymn, then they have a prayer, then they have young people's address, but things follow the pattern. The ecumenical thing is a pattern. And so we go to church um, thinking that church will fall into this pattern and it does have a pattern. That's why religion is a social institution. And so right through society, all of these social institutions form a pattern. You, what, um, for you to remember sociology, you think of it as a, pa a pattern behavior. These social institutions all have pattern behavior. And when we come to functionalism, you realize that functionalism believes that we have social order because all of these social institutions function to maintain that social order. So which is why it's very important that as we look at social institutions, social order. This one, as we say, very important because this is the starting point for the functionalists. The Marxist conflict don't start there, but in terms of social order, we say that account to Arlambus, it's a form, um, it formed the basis of social unity, of social solidarity, since individuals will tend to identify and feel kinship with those who share the same value uh, as themselves. So we talk about, um, we have in social order. So for example, we have certain rules, certain laws, certain basic do's and don'ts in society to maintain the, 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 the social order. You are in class, the teacher expects that if you have a question, you raise your hand and the te teacher will identify you and then you will speak. So everything, we, we assume that there's a social order. But the social order, we tend to agree on what is social order. There are certain basic things in society that represent social order for everybody. But there are some society that certain things are not part of their social order. So it is important that we understand that. Socialization. Again, this is another very important part of sociology because right throughout sociology, when we seek to understand, especially when we come to Unit 2, we are looking at crime and deviant poverty and so on. It's very important that we understand the part played by sociology. Very important that we understand that um, socialization um, is important to how we interact, to how we behave, to the things we do and just how we fit into society because it will all all goes back to how we socialize how we were socialized so socialization um, a basic definition is it is how we learn to become humans uh, one thought that once you're born of a human being you're a human being no uh, you have to learn to become human so it's the process we're in the helpless infant gradually becomes a self-aware knowledgeable person skilled in the ways of the culture in which he or she was born. Because another definition we have of, of, of socialization, we call it enculturation. This is how you learn the culture of the society. Very important that, um, that you understand that. And we also say it's a lifelong experience by which individuals construct um, their personal biography, assemble daily interaction rules and come to terms with the wider patterns of their culture. Very important. So socialization, um, is how we learn the culture of society. It's how we learn to become humans in society. So it is very important that you understand the concept of socialization because we'll be going back to it over and over when we come to deal with all of the social institutions. Again, um, in the sociological theories, we again look at the term socialization.
So we have primary socialization, that understandably take place in the primary institution of the family, cancer the most important. You're born into a family, and so most of the norms and values that you learn in order to cope in society come through the family. So it takes place during infancy within the context of the family. However, socialization lasts um, from the womb, they say, to the tomb. But primary socialization takes place in the, in the family, in the primary institution. Secondary socialization occurs after infancy, builds on the process of primary socialization, less hierarchical. So you go out to school, you go to work in an, uh, in an organization. Just like when you're doing groups, you did primary groups, which are groups in um, like the family that have strong emotional ties. You spend a long time in it and close knit. Whereas um, secondary social groups, these are wider groups. You do not have strong emotional ties, but you're in it for a purpose. You're in it because it serves a purpose. You're at work because you want to earn some money so you can pay your rent, pay your mortgage, pay your car, send your children to school, and just enjoy life. So there's a purpose. Now, there are types of socialization that you're required to know, especially for your MCQ, your multiple choice question. These definitions are important, which is why I have them here, so we can go through them. Re-socialization. Of course, this, um, this is how you learn how to cope if you migrate. If you migrate to America, despite the fact that it looks like Jamaica on the TV, America is not Jamaica. And so you have to be re-socialized. It's usually relevant to adults. Um, the process of learning new standards, values, cultures, uh, rehabilitation. For example, also, if you have a stroke or if you have a heart attack, sometimes um, the, 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 the palliative process, how you, how you um, learn to come back to normal, you have to, you have to be re-socialized. You have to learn how to walk again, how to talk again. And so that's the process of re-socialization. Reverse socialization. Within the context where we are in this technological driven world, the technology is happening so fast that we have now the children teaching the parents how to use their phone. I have to ask my son Brian how to do many things on my phone, despite the fact that I am the father and he's a child. So this is what we call reverse socialization and so on. So we also have anticipatory socialization, that process of uh, of orienting you in terms of a future role that you have. And so we move on now to discussing the perspectives. The, the issue of social perspective is trying to understand uh, that there's nothing to SWAT. We keep trying to SWAT what functionalism is, SWAT what uh, 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 um, Marxist conflict is, SWAT, SWAT what interactionism is. No, it's not necessarily. If you spend as much time trying to understand as you try to swap, then you'll find that each time you're ready to go again, there's nothing to swap because you understood what, what you did the last time. So we start by looking at the fact that the perspective, we have macro perspective and micro perspective. What it means that there are two different ways or two different angles in which individuals look at society. Some from a macro perspective, some from a micro perspective. So the macro perspective um, is of course, looks at the wider impact of society on the individual and how they shape his or her behavior. So what we look at, um, and this is like the functionalist and the Marxist conflict are macro perspective. So we look at how, according to their theory, how they see society. Society is the one that influences the individual rather than the individual um, being, um, being influenced, influenced in society or the individual taking their own action into their own hand. So the macro theorists look at how society um, shape the behavior of the individual. So for example, the, the macro theorists believe that we, criminals are not born, really. Um, society turns into a criminal. Society shape your behavior to becoming a criminal. You can argue whether they are right or they are incorrect or partially right. That's up to you. That's why sociology is a critical theory. So this is the approach of both the functionalist and the conflict perspective. So again, both see society uh, as a system of interrelated parts um, being analyzed in relationship to the whole. 
um, thus the individual is seen as, as a passive contributor to the construction of his or own perspective. One of the things that um, I should have pointed out in the basic concept is the organic concept because we're going to use it here in functionalism and we're going to use it um, also in, um, in Marxist conflict and also in interactionism. The organic concept which we got from Herbert Spencer is that um, society itself is interrelated and interconnected. No man is an island. No man stands alone. We um, I don't make any of the clothes that I have on. I, do, I, I didn't make the watch, nor the glasses. I depended on somebody else in society. So we have to depend on each other because that is the nature of society, that we are organic. We have to depend on each other in order for us to survive. So sociology takes an organic view of society. We think that all the various social institutions are interrelated and, and they also interdepend on each other. So it is important that we understand that if we are to look at the theories. So we start by, by looking at functionalism. And functionalism, again, we have to put things in, in perspective. Historically, functionalism was the first sociological theory. Remember again that sociology was not a modern discipline. Um, well, it's a modern discipline, but was it an ancient discipline like mathematics and uh, um, calculus and, uh, and economics and so on. Um, it really developed as we almost entered the industrial society. So um, European society went through a couple of things, a couple of changes in terms of um, they went through reformation, they went through the French, French Revolution and then an industrial revolution. But before that, rationality was the first thing that took place in European society. So we have to understand, so functionalism was the first. Very important because if you put it in perspective, then you understand why they view society from a particular angle. Uh, what was happening in society at the time, why this is how they view society. And so, and so the functionalists view society, their starting point is social order. They believe that everything starts with social order. So we say that um, functionalism sees individuals as being influenced by society through social facts. Now Durkheim, who came up with the term social facts, um, think that we are influenced by these social facts. What are these social facts? These are norms, values, these are laws, rules, regulations that force us to behave and to conform to society. So you enter school, uh, when I entered KC, um, I was told that don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, and wear the KC tie, make sure you come to school every day, and so on and so forth. So these are rules and regulations. And within society, we have laws, don't steal, don't this, don't that, don't that. And so these are the things that shape our behavior. So if you think that is you, just don't do them. Yes, there may be some people who are like that, but basically you are influenced by these um, social facts. So you don't steal because there's prison if you steal. Um, you obey certain rules and regulations. Um, I figure TVJ has its own rules and regulations. Every organization has its rules and regulations. These are what shape our behavior. This, these are the things that conform our behavior. So it is important that we understand these social facts. The, um, these coerce individuals into acting, and the action of the individual are neither physiological nor psychological. We don't, um, you, you can criticize uh, the person, they, they said, don't decide to steal. Society forces the person to steal. We, we can say whether that is right or wrong, definitely. Um, so we have here that um, Talcott Parson, the main theorist, and Emil Durkheim, and so on. So um, social facts, we just dealt with them. So there are other concepts. They see the social institution as functioning in relation to the social structure and society as a whole. The social institution, as I said earlier, function to maintain social structure and social order. So the family, the church, the school, and so they all function to maintain social order. For the functionalists, the reason why for them social institutions are so important, they believe that if you are out of order with society, that is, if you are out of the normal order of society, social institutions are created 
to, um, to rehabilitate you and then put you back in society. So which is why if you steal, we have social institutions such as prisons that will then rehabilitate you and put you back into society. Um, so so th these social institutions serve that function and so on. So the first, um, another concept we have is value consensus. Um, very important, values are the things that we think are near and dear to us. For in Jamaica, we value children. We value a job. We value um, a house. Um, most of us, um, our basic thing when we started working is to try to buy, buy a house where I can live with my wife and children and so on and so forth. So um, the, the functionists speak of, uh, in, in terms of Talcott Parson, value consensus. Members of society base their integration on value consensus and an agreement about values. We all tend to agree on the basic values in society that yes, we value house, yes, we value car, we value children, we value the elderly, and we want to ensure that um, we do not infect them with, with, with COVID-19. Because we value them and want them to remain with us as long as possible. And so value consensus. Following from, from value consensus as, um, as well um, is, a, a, is social conscience. Um, we, we, we all have, this, have, this, have this, this consensus in terms of how we behave. So we look on the road and we see um, somebody beating a child, a little three-year-old child, badly. We, we all will grasp and shirk because no, it, it just doesn't look right. That is because we have a, um, a collective conscience. We all know that something about that seems wrong and so on. So that's also one of the concepts of functionalism. Of course, um, they have what are called functional prerequisites. I won't go through all of them, um, but we call it the agile schema adaptation because we must adapt to environment. Goal attainment, important because um, in keeping us alive as we move from one potential to achieve self-actualization. It's important that we, we have goals. We all set goals. And so you want to achieve this one. You achieve this one, you set another one. Integration, most important. Again, that comes from the organic concept. We all have to integrate. That is from social solidarity so we can, we can um, survive. Latency or pattern maintenance. We discussed the importance of pattern maintenance already when you look at social institutions. We depend on that pattern in society for orderly conduct. We think that um, the driver in front of me will, 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 will show a brake light when he's about to stop. Um, he'll stop at a stoplight and so on and so forth. We depend on that pattern in society. And you'll be surprised how the pattern can become even personal. You put on the same foot of pants every day if you're a man. I go through my left foot first. If I try to put on the right foot, I fall down and almost one drop. So criticism of functionalism is that it pays too little attention to the human construction of social reality. And you can understand, they are saying that criminals really um, were not born, they are made, most people, that society influences them. So it really doesn't pay um, much attention to your own social reality. Uh, what about there are people who just decide to become criminals, uh, had nothing to do with society? and so on. And there are some criminals that they just decide to become, um, they're born in a house with plenty, but they become criminals and so on. Pays too much attention to social order, of course, because that is their starting point. They, they, they pay much attention to it. Assume too much importance to consensus, because it's called a consensus theory, really, where they look at how oh, all of us tend to agree on the same values, all of us um, have the same collective conscience, and all of us tend to think and act act the same way. All right, we move on now to Marxist conflict. Marxist conflict theory, again, draws heavily on Marxist theory, but again, remember, we have to put things in context. Um, functionalism was the first theory. Marxist conflict was developed in criticism of functionalism. Was developed in criticism of functionalism. So functionalism starts with social order. Marxist theory said no. No, 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 no. Um, there's no social order in society. Everything starts with conflict. Conflict is a starting point of their examination of society. As I said, because they are in, um, in criticism of, of functionalism, they start at the other spectrum. So functionalism, social order, Marxist concept, uh, Marxist conflict, no. Um, we deal with conflict. So of course, because it draws heavily on Marxist theory, 
Marx's theory is also, um, some part of it is called theory of economic determinism. In other words, according to Marx, the, the economy or your money determine um, your behavior and your values. So according to Marx, um, the economy formed the base of society or the infrastructure, uh, which then create a superstructure of values and belief system. In other words, money determine your values, money determine your value system, and so on. We can again argue whether money affects everything. Um, it's open for discussion whether it affects love, whether it affects religion, and so on. But that's Marxist conflict theory. Okay, so it opposes functionalism, emphasizes conflict as an inevitable factor of social life, as the most important agent for social change. Um, the conflict perspective helps us to see how inequality and the conflict it generates are rooted in the organization of society itself. Because um, this conflict causes uh, a lot of exploitation, how people treat people, how one group is treated um, against another. So, so Marxist conflicts look at the various groups in society and how groups try to exploit each other. How um, we have what are called some dominant groups because of the money they have, because of the power that they have regarding how society is, um, is structured. And so they would try to exploit another set. So according to Marx, this conflict is perpetuated between the different groups and classes in society. He also said that it is perpetual, ongoing, ever going, um, never ending, um, this conflict in society. So it envisages society as an arena of inequality that generates conflict and change. Factors that fuel inequality are race and ethnicity, gender, color, wealth, age, geographical location, and so on. When, when you come to social, um, social stratification, you go back through all of these to look at um, how they function within the Caribbean society, where what part does race and ethnicity play, gender especially, a major basis of social um, stratification, color, wealth, and age, and so on. So we, we spoke about the economic basis of society. According to Marx, um, ex uh, the, the history of all is to exist in societies um, is the history of class struggles. He said that this is what is, is very important in society. The history of society can be understood by examining the different historical epoch, what was happening, and so on and so forth. Note that within this, individual is seen as passive, just like um, for the for the functionalist, that is, is society influence the behavior of the individual. So we have the history of class struggles, dialectic movement, struggle between owners of the means of production and the sellers of labor. So of course, um, most of us who are workers, we would be considered um, labor. Uh, the people who own, who, who own the factory, who own the organization, um, they will be considered the, um, the, the bourgeoisie and we, the workers, would be considered the proletariat. So change involves tension between um, opposing forces. So of course, some uh, Marxist concept, theory of economic determinism, I mentioned that already, that um, Marx and Marxists believe that the money, the economy, determines your behavior in, in, in everything. You can argue whether that is true or false. Um, mode of production, uh, in terms of with each um, with each eon or era in society, there is a particular mode of production. So we started out with our culture, then then we moved to mechanical, then we moved to electrical, and now we are we are at electronic. With each mode of production comes a relations of production. When we had um, farming as the mode of production, people had large families, 13, 15 children. Everybody worked on the farm because that was the mode of production. We then moved to mechanical. We started to have mechanical harvesters. So we have less family because we have less need for so many children uh, to work uh, on, the, um, on the farm. So we then move on to electrical. You, you, you turn a switch and a lot of things happen. Um, during my time as a child, 
I would, um, I would come home from school, I would turn on the TV, um, go to bed, um, catch the fire, uh, fan the thing before the TV come on. It was JBC at the time. We'd ramp a room at five o'clock. And so that was the, the, the electrical era. We now moved to an electronic era. I can stay at work and turn on my TV. I can stay at work and turn on my air condition. God, that's the era in. And with each mode of production comes a kind of behavior. That's what Marx meant by when he said, with each mode of, with each mode of production comes our relations of production. As we change from one to another, uh, from, from our culture to mechanical, to electrical, to electronic, our behavior changed. So we are now in what we call name um, a postmodern type kind of behavior. So, um, so you, you, you grew up on a cell phone. Um, you have ideas of, of, of instantan instantaneity for everything. I want my mother a car, I know, a car on the cell phone. And so we know into that electronic mode of production where everything is based on electronic, believe it or not. And that's where we are at. So criticism again of Marxism, views and direction of social change have not materialized. Um, the social change that Marx envisaged was that over time, the proletariat would become so fed up with the bourgeoisie that they would overthrow the bourgeoisie and set up a classless society. Now, the, the idea of a classless society is what we call a panacea. Um, a society in which everybody's at the same level. Um, I, I really can't picture it unless you're in heaven. You died and gone to heaven. Um, so how else we can, because once you are a, a human being, from your start, from your born, you are, you are being taught to, um, to discriminate. You have been taught um, through socialization that you need to do this. Don't be like them. Don't be like those over there. Don't be like that one. Go to school. Don't go to that school. Go to this school. And so there's all the concept of, of inequality. Marx didn't explain how that transformation would take place, where the human being was part of a, of a, cla of a society that, is, um, that have a lot of classes would now become part of a class-less society. Um, he didn't explain that. Little indication of proletariat becoming a class for itself. Um, the, the proletariat is all of us who work, all of us. Um, how do we get everybody to become a group, a, a, a class? All the workers of the world, because he's saying that the workers of the world will, would unite and have this revolution to overthrow the bourgeoisie and set up a classless society. But how do you um, get workers in the US, workers in Jamaica, workers in Cuba, workers in, um, in, in Zagreb, Croatia, all of us to have this, um, th this commonality of thought and we'll overthrow the bourgeoisie and set up a classless society. Um, we don't see it materializing and Marx didn't give a time frame for it as well. Class structure in capitalist society is not characterized by polarization, but is more complex, including a growing middle class. Um, that is so true. During the time when Marx lived, and you have to understand the limitations of his writing within the context of the time in which he lived. Marx lived from 1818 to 1883. So he lived entirely within the, the 19th century. He never, um, he really didn't come into industrial society, although he was on the cusp of industrial society. But he really never lived to come over into industrial society like Weber. Weber lived like 1864 to 1920. So mean that so he was in the 20th century. So hence his concept of social stratification is wider than that of Marx. For Marx, society was just the haves and the have not. Plain and simple. You have or you don't have. You're rich or you're poor. There's no middle class. So um, so that's his concept of social stratification. Weber is a little different. Weber, who lived until 1920, said, yes, you, you still have the, um, the, the bourgeoisie, but you have the white collar worker, um, which was part of the middle class. You also have the petty bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The petty bourgeoisie are these people who sell, who have their own local businesses. They sell on the street corner. They have a local shop, a local supermarket, and so on. So um, Marx didn't see that happening um, during his time when he lived. So which is why um, for him, society was just the proletariat, and the bourgeoisie. So um, religious belief provided the ethics, attitudes, and motivation for the development of capitalism. Now, if you understand Marx and Marxist concept and Marxism, 
almost everything will come to exploitation of one class over another. That is, that is the basic thing about our Marxist society, our Marxist theory. So once you understand this concept, so we say, what's the Marxist concept of crime? Because again, um, of the exploitation given by one class over another, it forced some people to steal. You almost can, can, can guess what it is, what it means, very much so, and so on. And so communist societies are not what Marx envisioned. Social inequality is still present. Because, of course, when it, in 1917, when they had the Bolshevik Revolution, they said, ah, Marx theory will come through. But again, by the time we reached 1980, going on into 1990, we had perestroika in Russia, um, where people begin to say, um, but we cannot prefer a capitalist society. Because I can understand why, if I'm in charge of five million people, why am I living in the same house like them? Why am I driving the same car? So this idea of classless society never materialized. So again, the macro perspective, they look on society from the point of view of the individual. Different from the, the macro, that of a top-down view, they take a, um, a view from the level of the individual. They are also concerned about how the individual shape, uh, are shaped by its interaction and symbols and so on. Mm -hmm. um, this here gives central to human process interactionists. Uh, this is really just looking at how we interact and how we develop ways of interacting and how we give meaning to, um, to, to, to symbols as we interact. So for example, I'm walking on the street and I say, um, a raster man is it's green and gold. He said, blessed. Right now, but we say blessed to everybody now, given COVID-19. But we generally would, would to the dread say, blessed. And they said that the deeper the bow, um, the greater the respect. So there are means of how we interact with each other. And so um, you come into the classroom, the teacher is in front of the class, that is symbolic. So someone who comes into class and says, good afternoon teacher, may I speak to um, student Brown, and so on, because that is part, part of it, and so on. So that's our reaction. That's a, not a difficult one for you to understand. The feminist perspective, um, of course, I just touched some of the things that, like feminism, what it is, patriarchy, hierarchical structure, sexism, this, I put silly idea that women are inferior to men, misogyny, hatred of women, hegemonic masculinity, um, this is how men are, are grown in society to be, um, to be dominant. And then we also, that dominance can become toxic, so we have toxic ma masculinity. That's it. So, one, two. Um, you would have gone through all, all the theories. Make sure, sure that you understand micro versus macro. Make sure that you understand um, the various things. But we also have some pre-prepared questions from some K past papers. Um, 2016, 2017, and so on. We'll look at some of the questions in terms of applying what we have learned since the session started and how to approach those questions. It's important that you, you in terms of understanding, answer what the question asks for, asks you for. There's a tendency to tell the examiner all that you know, whether they ask for it or not. And we are saying no, no. Um, there, there's a basic way or structure in which you answer, especially long structured question. You have an introduction. What, is, what do you understand the question to be saying to you? How do you interpret the question? How will you approach the question? All of that and any definitions would be done in the introduction. Then you have the body of it where you are now engaging with what the question asks for. And then you have, a, um, you have a conclusion. So it is important that you understand all that you are doing. If you finish one paragraph and there's no link to the question, you need to revisit that paragraph. There must, there must be some interjunction, somewhere, um, some conjunction in which you link the question to what you just did, and so on. So we have questions here that I took from 2016 k Pass papers, June 2016. Question, the first question said, given 2006, Define social as the study of social life, group, and society, and outlines the development of the discipline as a response to changes occurring within European society. And so, um, discuss three of these changes, should have been one. Discuss three of these changes that led to the origin of sociology and comment on at least one factor that gave rise to the discipline within the Caribbean region. So here, so it, it asks about 
and the, the sociology and societies. So we look, remember I went through two definitions, a basic one, so, um, sociology, the, the, the systematic study of individuals and groups in society as they interact. But that's a basic one. We went into another one that sociology was developed to account for the changes that accompanied industrial society. A much broader de um, de definition. That's what they ask you about in this question. They ask you about not the first definition, but about that broader definition. What were some of these changes that led to the development of sociology? And so, again, here we go for historical sensibility. We go historically to look at what were some of these changes. So we can start with rationality, that there was a period in, in, in European society when rationality spread like light to enlighten people's darkness. So the period was called the period of enlightenment and so on. So that was one. Um, people challenged the church, because at that time the church had sway over everything. And so people begin to know to challenge the church. And so people start to question things and we start to see the use of signs. Then now we had Reformation. This was the questioning of the church during the period when the church was dominant. Martin Luther and Zwingli, uh, Martin Luther marched to the church of Rome and, and posted on the door of the church 20 ways in which the church, the church should reform. You know, they said that timing is everything. Had he done that a couple years earlier, he would have been burnt at the stake. But the fervor of change and, um, was taking place in society, so it caused the church to look inside, look at the theology that was being preached, and look at how um, individuals were reacting to the church. So the Reformation led to a lot of um, other denominations coming into being. So you're either a, a Protestant or you're a Catholic. The standard church at the time was Catholic. So all the other churches are Protestant, including Anglican, Baptist, you name it, Reformed Church, Methodist, all of them. So it is this period that we saw that reform taking place. We move on and we also move into the, um, the French Revolution, 1789. Um, in 1789, um, the, 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 people, the people of France um, rose up and overthrew the monarchy. First time the monarchy was being overthrown in Europe. Um, and, uh, and then they created a democratic society. Um, it was again rationality reached this level where people became rational about their type of government that they should have in their country. And then we went, um, we moved into again industrial society. Um, industrial society, we started to see the use of science um, to invent things. We started to see uh, um, the, the discovery of carbon that could burn um, um, for a couple of thousand degrees centigrade. And, so, um, and the blast furnace, and so on and so forth. So all of these ushered in a type of society that people wanted to know what were these changes? What, what was it that was causing all of these changes in the European society? So of course, they turned to the academy. Um, they, they said, um, we have no such course or, or, or discipline that could explain to us why these changes? Why is it that people were committing suicide at a higher level? then um, that, that, of course, Emil Durkheim wrote about, um, w w explained to us. And so this is how social design was developed to account for those changes that accompanied industrial society. And so, um, so Auguste Comte, along with others, started to develop a discipline called sociology to explain some of these social issues in society, to explain um, how different groups behave in society, to explain deviance in society, to explain crime, to explain poverty, and so on and so forth. So, so which is why um, they developed socially to explain all of those things. It was a scientific discipline because the original persons were, were all what we call positivists. You should know that term for your MCQ, your, your, your multiple choice questions, and a positivist is one who look, um, who, who, who use the, the methodology of the natural sciences to look at social phenomena. So um, phenomena such as suicide, depression, and so on. They say we can use the same scientific method to examine them. So um, Comte himself was a, a, a positivist, Emile Durkheim was a positivist, and so sociology started as being that kind of scientific discipline, and, uh, and so on. So, so you, you, you understand. So you could use any three. You could use reformation, rationality. Um, you could also use one that um, I, I left out was the Renaissance. 
People started to paint differently. People started to draw differently. People started to sing differently, and so on. All right, next one. Um, let's see which of these we shall do. All right, let me just touch on the last one since we didn't do social stratification. With reference to either the conflict or interaction this perspective, discuss the functionalist view that stratification is a universal system that benefits society. Now, um, different perspectives view stratification differently. Here they ask for the functionalist one in terms of how they view stratification because um, they saw it as a universal system. They say that um, it happens in society, people will always be better than people, and so it's not a big deal. Um, it's not the same argument of the, fun of the Marxist conflict, not the same argument of the interactionist. And so, um, so in looking at social stratification, the functionalists believe that uh, the best jobs are left for the most qualified people in society. Uh, really? Like seriously? Like honestly? So if I'm, if I are first class honors, I am assured I'm getting a job over my friend Mark, who just get a pass in the same degree. But I look around and see Mark working long before me. How, how do I explain that? Um, because, of course, because in our society, can I remember most of these functionalists, and here we're talking for the functionalists, uh, um, they're looking at a society, historically European society, not our society. Uh, um, so consequently, our, um, our behavior would have been different from them. And so, um, so as we look at questions such as these, it's important that you understand both social stratification, the many different parts of social stratification, as well as you understand functionalism. So it is important that we look at those issues. So we can spend some more time on looking at, at some of the subjects, some of the questions, but um, hopefully we get a chance for next time. So that's all for Cape Sociology. I hope that um, you grasp some of the concepts and points that were made. Um, you can catch a repeat on today's lesson on JNN today at 5 p.m. And, and the school's not out highlight on Saturday between one and four here on TVJ. It will also be videoed um, on demand at One Spot Media. So until next time, again, I'm the excited teacher, Arvill Beckford, for sociology. Enjoy and continue to do well. Social is an excellent subject. You can get a one. Bless.